All right. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Commit Porto. Thanks a lot, organizers, for having me and for the invitation. So I'm Eric. Um, I'm co-founder and CTO of FreightHub. FreightHub is a Berlin-based tech-enabled logistics company. And what we're doing is exactly... Do I have to turn it on? Do we have to move it in some direction? You destroyed Let me just my first confirm. point. <laughs> Uh, try now, because it might be the ah, opposite. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. And so, as I said, FreightUp is a digital logistics company, and what we're doing is exactly that up there. So we're helping our customers to move goods globally around the world. Businesses that want to ship stuff from Asia to Europe, sea freight, air freight, rail freight, and so on. And our key value proposition to our customers is that we want to do that in a very, very transparent way. To give you a better idea about um, our problem space um, uh, before diving into technology and event sourcing, um, sorry, wrong direction. Let me show you a bit how, how a service that we operate typically works. So our customer uh, in this example here mandates us to ship five containers from uh, Fuju in China, where he's got a factory, to Braga, right? Um, because we're here in Portugal now. Um, we are going to organize a truck in Fuzhou. We're going to um, get the truck to transport the goods to the Shanghai port. We have operations teams on the ground that organize everything. Um, in Shanghai, we're going to load it on a container vessel. That container vessel is going to ship it um, in a 20-day journey over to the port of Porto. And then in Porto, we're going to unload it again. We're going to do some documentation, customs clearance, lots of paperwork, actually, some stuff also digital. And we're going to move that in a truck again to the warehouse of our customer in Braga. And along that process, we're integrated with a couple of data providers. We're getting geo coordinates from our trucking companies. We're also monitoring the vessels with um, a technology called AIS so, and satellite monitoring, so we know exactly where they are at any point in time. Um, we'll get information from terminals, ports, like vessel departures, customs clearances, and so on, many, many more, in order to really know very well what's going on. And we'll have hundreds or thousands of events for each of the shipments that we process, uh, and that can be actually quite a challenge. Now, we want to show our customer in the end, you know, this, this is how our product looks like. We want to tell them exactly where is your shipment at the moment, what happened in the past, where is it going to go, and very importantly, based on all the data that we're getting, we want to do a real-time ETA calculation that should be ideally very precise and very accurate. Uh, ideally, we'll also send some notifications at times um, so uh, they know about events that happened, and this is a bit the problem space that we're in. So we started out in 2016, early 2016, and what you do when you just, you know, build a company in the beginning, um, you build a prototype, very simple. And we build what I call here in this talk now the classical model, right? We had one database, no SQL database already at that day, MongoDB, um, and we basically just had events that were coming in. We had some business logic that would update ETAs and data in our database, and then the front end and notifications and so on would read from the database, just you know how you build it in the most straightforward way. Now, um, we had two very severe challenges that uh, we came across, actually, that made us very, very slow uh, in developing continuously after approximately one year in the business. What happened? Number one is we were sort of, you know, um, uh, young in the business, and we had only limited ideas about logistics. So the business logic evolved very often, right? As an example, our understanding about how to calculate an ETA based on events coming into our system was constantly evolving. Um, so what do you do? You want to make sure your customer, you know, benefits from your updated knowledge about how to calculate an ETA based on a vessel arrival date in Porto. Um, now, the problem is, you know, you have some state in the database and you sort of have to reverse engineer what kind of events have led me to think that this is the ETA for that shipment. And how can I now reapply my better knowledge, my updated business logic? What we ended up with is what I call here migration hell, <laughs> because um, not only the complexity mentally, 
of, of you know, building the migrations for the database was really challenging. But at the same time, what's also really painful is we had a lot of data and migrations would just take two days or something like that. So that was really a pain in the butt. Second, um, debugging, right? We often felt like that guy up there. Um, we were like, in an industry, you know, logistics doesn't sound very digital. We're getting a lot of bad data. And often we're like, why the fuck is the, the, the current track and trace status like this? Um, there must be some data source that sends like really bad data at like really off times. Uh, debugging is a hell. I mean, obviously we had like standard application debugging to text files and stuff like that, but it was really a pain in the butt. So these two problems combined together, that was a big trouble for us because we became really, really slow in moving forward with our business. Luckily, you can guess it from the event title, there's some help. And that help that we found there is called event sourcing. Event sourcing is a persistence mechanism, and the idea of event sourcing is that instead of storing the current application state, we want to store it indirectly as a history of changes that lead us to the current state, that lead us to the current truth, basically. How does it look like? One of the core ideas is you have an event stream that is ordered, time is going down in this example, and how it could look like a freight hub is as following, right? Dramatically simplified, of course. Um, a customer books a shipment, and we assign in that moment a shipment ID so we can reference it in the future, makes sense. Um, now the vessel departs, we recognize that through one of our integrations, we see, okay, it's departed from Shanghai uh, at a specific time. We monitor the vessels with our satellite tracking. Um, we get an updated location. We know now 20th of, of February at 10.30. Um, it's very close to Portugal um, already, or to Porto exactly. Um, nine degrees latitude and 42 deg nine degrees longitude and uh, 42 degrees latitude, right? And a couple of hours later, the vessel has arrived. Cool, okay. Now, in event sourcing, how do we derive truth? How do we derive our application state if we only have the event stream? Well, in this example, we've read now two events in our event stream, and we can, with even mathematical beauty or simplicity, we're going to aggregate up these events and potentially have some business logic also encoded there, and we're gonna end up with the current truth, with a virtual application state, um, with the shipment. The shipment one, two, three, last port call was Shanghai, the timestamp um, of the last port call was January, um, 28th, 6 a.m., right? Second example, to make that um, clear, now let's consider we have had all these four events that we received, um, we aggregate them all up, we understand, okay, now our shipment actually ID uh, 123, the last port call now is Porto, at a specific timestamp we got this information, and the last vessel update was at this location. The bottom line here is the idea of event sourcing is that we can deterministically rebuild our application state, our truth, based on the event stream, right? So every time I wanna know what's the status of the shipment, instead of having that stored somewhere, we're just gonna read through the event stream, aggregate up all the information, and we're gonna end up with our current state, our current truth. Some observations. Um, what do we need in order to get there? If, if any of you are familiar, with domain-driven design, you'll notice the shipment events, uh, the domain events that we have here are not called shipment created event, shipment updated event, and so on, but they have some meaningful names, right? In event sourcing, ideally you wanna make sure that your events have some meaning for domain experts out there in the wild. Huh? So we can actually also call them domain events. Um, secondly, we said earlier, we want to be able to deterministically rebuild the application state. In order to do that, we need to make sure that our events are mutable. Makes a lot of sense because they're in the past and the past usually doesn't change in our universe. Um, and the events must be ordered, otherwise it doesn't work as well, right? If you have these, these two properties, you can rebuild the application state every point in time by just reading through your event stream. That's pretty straightforward. Very simple. Where did this get us? Well, number one, finally, we had a log, right? And that log was not only a very well-structured log, it was also sort of a first-class citizen in this persistence architecture. And it was a first-class citizen and also the single source of true. And that makes a lot of sense for every kind of problem that you're dealing with where the domain, the data that you want to store is essentially event-driven because it feels much more natural to store events like that 
then writing them and sort of, you know, aggregating them in a database and forgetting about the history. The second big benefit is that the system behavior obviously is traceable. Not only because we have a first class citizen log, sort of, but also because there is one cool invariance. Um, the current application state, or what's currently displayed on the UI to the user, this is determined by the code that's currently live on production, that's currently live on our master branch in production. In the classical model, that doesn't apply because there's maybe some old code we already want to forget about, it was so bad, and that is updated in the past based on some events, the data in our database, and we don't really know, know anymore how did we get there. In this model, that doesn't exist, right? Because we basically do a live recalculation of our truth of our application state. So very easy to trace down what's happening here in our system. And second big topic, no database migrations are needed because once your business logic changes, you're just gonna go ahead, you deploy it to master, if you have continuous integration, five minutes, and uh, your UI changes, your customers benefit from your better understanding of how you calculate ETAs, what are the sort you challenged, uh, changed. So really, really great, um, huge benefit for us and dramatically improved basically um, how we thought about our persistence architecture. Moving on, well, I said event sourcing is a persistence mechanism and um, I wanna dive now in the second part a bit deeper on how does the architecture look like when you have an event sourced persistency in your component or your service or your application that you're designing. Um, if you have followed the talk thoroughly already, I hope so, um, you might ask yourself already some questions like how do we persist events? How do we, where does the aggregation logic go? How do we modularize it? Um, how do we execute side effects? Where do we send notifications and so on? And there is a pattern called CQRS that you can use here that many people nowadays use in the, in the context of microservices especially. And um, I wanna dive a bit deeper on that. CQRS, a bit of clunky name, stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It's an architectural pattern and the core idea of that pattern is instead of having one schema, like in our classical model, to which we write and read from and so on, we have two different data models. One for the write path into our application and one for the read path. So we have two optimized data models that help us do that in the most sleek or efficient way. That's implemented like this at Freight Hub. On the left side of the screen up there, you see the write path into the application. On the right side, you see the read path. So on the top left, you have the event stream, and you know that already from the previous examples, we got a couple of events on there. And the event schema in CQRS is basically the C, the command model. They say command is basically writes into our application, right? So that's our write model, our write data model, how we write data into our system. Now we have an event handler, and that event handler is responsible for doing some validation, reading the events for some event pass, event stream, um, and also executing consequential logic. So stuff I gotta do when this event comes in. For example, sending out a notification. Once the, success, the event handler successfully executed, I can store my event in an event store for persistency reasons now. So this is the right path, how I get data into my application, right? I read from the event stream, execute an event handler, basic logic, I put the stuff into my event store. Now the read side. We have an event aggregator that basically does what we described before. Um, in the event aggregator, we basically are responsible for creating our read models. So basically an optimized data model based on all the events in the event store that I can use for showing it to my customer, serving an internal API or whatever. In our example here, now we have only one read model, that's the transport plan. And you can already see from the naming and the structure of the transport plan, it is a very different model from the events. So the read model that we use to query data from our system has a very different structure and a very different intention than our write model. And both are optimal in a way because the events feel supernatural. They make sense in the real world and they are modeled like that here in our uh, domain. And the transport plan is exactly what I showed earlier on the screenshot, the ETA calculation and all of that, right? And you could even have multiple different query paths um, and multiple different aggregators that read from your event store. Now looking at the performance um, of this architecture, I said, I said earlier many, many events that we are 
getting into our system all the time, um, the right performance can be really, really great, much better than the classical SQL database scenario because um, we basically, in the event store, just need a simple append-only data structure in the simplest case, right? And we just pump events in there. On the read side, on the right side of that chart here, um, that can be a bit more tricky, obviously, because every time, especially when we have lots of events, we have to go through all the events. Every time I want to know what's the current tracking status, all the events. Obviously, most forward solution to implement that is a cache. Oh, sorry. Okay, I said that. That as well. Um, most obvious solution to do that is implementing a cache, right? And you can do for a classical way of implementing the cache. Every time some service queries your component for the transport plan, you warm that, you put that in the cache. We actually also chose to go a more proactive approach. We basically, um, as soon as an event is coming in, we proactively generate with the event aggregator the transport plan. We populate that in the cache, and that has led to some 10x, 12x improvement uh, for our read performance at a point where it was actually really bad a couple of seconds. So pretty straightforward, I guess, to implement that. To give you an idea how the technology is used um, uh, that we use in FreightHub, um, we are pretty AWS bound, so we use Amazon SQS for a queue, um, Node.js for the event handler and the event aggregator. Important, these must be two different services, right? Because um, the beauty in this model is we can scale the write path and the read path independently from each other. Um, we use MongoDB, just goes very well with Node, but also if your event schema differs a lot, NoSQL in general makes a lot of sense. And then on the, on the read path, um, we expose a REST API for querying the current state, the current transport plans, um, and Amazon SNS as an uh, event publishing mechanism, basically, right? And Redis for a cache, which is a pretty obvious choice, usually. So now um, that we went through that, um, we know every pattern has its ups and downs and um, benefits and challenges, and I want to um, go with you a bit about um, the learnings uh, that, we have, um, that we have examined here, um, implementing that the last two years. So on the benefit side, we said that earlier, really great, you got that audit log, and that log is a first-class citizen, right? It's the single source of truth, just goes very well when you have an event-driven domain or nature um, that you're modeling in. Second of all, traceability is very, very high in that architecture because not only you have that log, but the current code is always responsible for computing your current truth, your current application state. That makes, makes it very easy. Also, we said we don't need any database migrations. Really great if you have lots of data, right? If you have lots of data, really think about how can you avoid migrations. Now, after adding CQRS in the game, we can also optimize the read model and the write model of our application. We have these very sleek and nice events that represent very well how we think about, you know, updates to shipments coming in. And at the same time, we have these um, richer domain models that we use to communicate with the front end, with the UI, or other kind of internal um, needs that we have. Last but not least, you can achieve a very, very high, tremendously high read and write performance, right? I want to especially highlight here the write performance. So many trading systems, for example, um, are built on event sourcing because um, no classical database that has like fancy stuff like, you know, joins and all of that um, can usually get there. So when you need really high write performance, it's a good idea to go for that. Um, obviously, there are some downsides, unfortunately, that you have to cope with. First of all, the, the one that you have with every new pattern, unfamiliarity. Um, especially when it comes to CQRS, it is something that we encounter. It's not super straightforward. It's just not that classical model of having one schema. You read to it, um, you read from it, you write to it, and you want to make sure that your team is properly educated when you implement this model. Um, secondly, in any event-driven architecture, or mostly, you also start to e introduce eventual consistency. And now in the days of big data, we all sort of take it super easy with eventual consistency and say, okay, everything should be eventually consistent anyway, otherwise we cannot scale. Still, think carefully if you want to do that, because it can have very practical um, consequences, right? Like, um, you have a UI, you press a button, and if your whole evented architecture takes 20 seconds to return under some load, what do you do with the user feedback in the meantime? So these can be some practical challenges when you introduce eventual consistency, and you want to make sure you carefully think about whether you want to go down that path. Um, 
Not exactly a downside, but a challenge to implement is certainly also event schema changes. So what happens when our shipment uh, booked event suddenly changes? We rename fields, so breaking changes. We rename fields, we change data types. Um, in that case, we don't want to do mi database migrations, right? That, that, that's all to be uh, a benefit of this model. But what you can do basically is you implement an adapter in the event store that is able to upgrade events from the old schema to the new schema. And then basically every time you read stuff from the event store, you do a live migration of all the events. That's something many people do. Um, at the same time, you want to be careful when you have lots of schema changes because then you actually have code legacy again and you're going to see how the schema was five years ago and you still have to upgrade that. Yeah? So potentially, when you have lots of schema changes, you might need to go for a different ver um, method here like snapshotting, for example. Biggest downside from my perspective really is um, searchability in this, in this model here. It's really, really, really hard to search through, um, through this architecture here. So in a classic database, we have even indexes, right, that help us to search through large amounts of data. But in our event sourcing CQRS architecture here, we don't even necessarily store all the current application state of all our shipments, for example, all our entities um, in the cache, right? Um, so it's essentially, if you want to search and you don't have any other supporting data structures for that or systems, it's a very, very heavy uh, operation, like a super, super table scan, race to the table scan, race to the table scan. It's a really bad operation actually, right? And you want to make sure you have some supportive system that um, helps you searching. This doesn't work for searching. Um, last but not least, uh, very little but practical um, thing we encountered, you know, who doesn't remember the good old days 10 years ago when we all used PHP admin to quickly fix some stuff in our SQL database. Um, that, that doesn't work here, right? You can't quickly, as an operations team, go in the database when the customer calls you up and says there's something wrong. You can't just go in and change some data. This is also certainly a big problem. So um, you want to be aware of that, um, but there's ways around it, of course. Now, if you hopefully ask yourself, um, should I be using event sourcing? Um, we've assembled a list of criteria when we think event sourcing can be a good choice. Um, but before we go into that, maybe, um, an anecdote on, on how widely it's actually used, but we often don't think. Um, nearly every database today is implemented with a so-called write-ahead log, or in MongoDB, for example, it's called oblog. And the idea of that write-ahead log is um, every operation that you execute in the database is stored in that log, and that log is persisted before you execute that on the database. Let's say you have an insert operation in a SQL database, you're going to store that insert operation first on the log, and then later you execute actually the actual insert on the data. That gives you atomicity and durability because if your database crashes, you can just replay all the commands from the log and you're back at where you are, right? And, and, and that's obviously a super important criteria for databases. And that is super, super similar, if not nearly the same with a different intention than event sourcing, right? So many, many systems that we use today um, will have this mechanism built in. Also, I guess 99% of people in the room use Git. Git essentially stores all the changes that we have in our code, and it is an event sourced system in a way, right? We store everything as a history of changes. Um, and maybe a third example from the non-tech world, um, accounting. I don't know if any of you guys here um, studied business, but um, accountants say we use pens, not pencils. What they mean by that is, they are going to record every single transaction and they are never deleting anything. And actually accounting is a discipline where by law you're required to be able to rebuild your current truth, your, your account balance for example, right, or your, um, your balance statement in the company, you should be able to rebuild that based on all the past transactions. So this is event sourcing in the real world actually. So what I just want to say with that, it's a very, very prevalent pattern in the real world and makes sense for a lot of different use cases. So now, going into these use cases. Um, when is event sourcing a good fit? Potentially, we said that earlier, when traceability is very important or even legally required. And in fact, um, when it's legally required, very often it's going to say you have to be able to rebuild the current state based on all the past transactions. And that, by definition, is event sourcing. Second, um, if your application needs to jump in time, right? 
Um, so that sounds pretty crazy, but the simplest example is an undo and a redo operation. What you can just do when you have event sourcing is you read only all but the last event, or you maybe replay an event to redo an operation. That's super, super easy suddenly if you have this first class citizen log. Sec third, um, if a domain like ours is inherently event driven, just makes a lot of sense to store stuff in, in, a, in, a, in a, an event sourcing way. Um, and also when you start to work with CQRS, um, sometimes it just feels more natural to do that when you don't really have this CRUD use case, right? So CRUD, create, read, update, delete, the classical model. CRUD in events in, for shipment tracking doesn't really make sense. It it's really doesn't come natural, right? So um, when, when your domain generally is event driven, um, this stuff makes a lot of sense. And last but not least, when you require really, really high write performance of events into your system. There are nowadays good databases for that, but um, really um, and that pattern can also help you to achieve that. All right, and with that, um, I want to conclude. Obrigado, thanks a lot for listening. These are my contact details. Reach out to me um, anytime. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. So now we're going to open the floor to some, any questions from the audience. If they have. There's one question here, please. The front. Uh, well done on the Portuguese, Eric. And contextualizing the example is really good as well. Yeah, I'm learning, I'm learning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you perhaps may talk about the, any tooling that you've built to help you with, the, with your new event, event sourcing system? Anything yeah. that's been particularly useful to you? Yeah. Um, we've, built, we've built some internal tooling um, that helps us to um, basically understand what's the current state, so we don't really have to execute. Um, we don't really have to execute these aggregations for debugging. That just makes a lot of sense, um, especially around uh, AWS, for example. So um, it's it's pretty hard when you use AWS queues to examine the contents when you do compression and stuff like that. So we built some browser browser plugins um, to be able to examine really what's going on on our queues. I think that was really hard usually. Um, other tools that we built um, internally were um, mechanisms for snapshotting, really, right? Um, I mean, we have that cache for our production architecture, but really snapshotting um, can be super useful, so you can always go back and see, okay, what's the current state actually um, in an auxiliary system, basically. That, that's something that just helps you with debugging. I think there's also a big downside, just going into the database and seeing what's going on, what's the current state is so hard. Um, but um, if you have any more specific questions, i um, happy to reach out via email and um, uh, solve that for you then. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, there's one here, please, in the front. Can you tell us a bit of how you overcome those downsides, especially when debugging information in the database? Did you use any strategies at all? Yeah. Let me go back. Oh, let me go back here to the the downsides. Um, unfamiliarity. I think every good engineering team should really focus on sharing knowledge. Um, I mean, just as an example, what we have established is like a weekly knowledge sharing session where people talk about their learnings. I guess that's pretty standard. Um, when it comes to eventual consistency, I mean, um, we basically, especially that UI topic, we've thought about that a lot. How do we deal with that on the front end? Um, perfect, from my perspective, there is no um, silver bullet for dealing with eventual consistency for user interfaces, um, but the obvious choices are like having a spinner or um, like many multiplayer games will do, for example. Just pretend that you updated something and already showed in the UI and maybe revert it back later, right? So um, in Counter-Strike, that's very well known, for example. <laughs> um, just faking the current state, right? And then potentially getting that reverted from the server. Um, Event schema changes, we actually do a live migration in our event store, so we really implement an adapter in the event store and we just update these events um, live. 
Um, and then search, um, we basically have um, a Elasticsearch instance um, where we put the most relevant aspects of these transport plans, of these read models, um, into the Elasticsearch instance there, and then we update them. That's also why we basically proactively, once an event comes in, run through the whole aggregation pipeline, so we always basically have all the entities aggregated somewhere, and, and that's in our case Elasticsearch, really. So if we don't have any other questions, thank you very much again, Eric. Cool. Well done. Thanks. Thank you for coming.